Good morning, everybody. Let's. As we discussed yesterday, sometimes the conversations around the edges are the best parts of conferences. I think this is one of those times that the conference itself is so exciting we want to get to it. Uh, yesterday there was a lot of passion in the room, but nobody was disagreeable, which was terrific. And I love that idea that there are people with so many different points of view, a lot of passion, but everybody feeling we're in, in an academic protected environment in a uh, spirit of uh, exploration, which is terrific. And this morning it's going to continue, I think, to be even uh, even more interesting. Um, we are, I want to remind people and those who weren't here before should know that we are being taped. This, everything here is on the record. Uh, so to the extent that that affects what you have to say, keep that in mind, please. Um, also, I want to say that I don't know how many of you noticed that there was a terrific piece by Abramowitz today on the front page of one of the sections uh, of the LA Times uh, on journalism in the military. And I thought, Bort, you are so timely. But of course, it was his daughter writing a, review, <laughs> a movie review. But she was timely for it. <laughs> so I thought she had to start it out as well. Uh, just to say a little bit about the order of battle this morning, um, we're going to start with Dick Reeves. Then we're going to move straight into Peter Galbraith, and who, who uh, Derek will introduce. And then Derek will lead a moderated discussion following the, uh, uh, the Galbraith uh, presentation. Um, after which we'll take a little break and then we'll come back with our panel and following the panel we'll have a conversation that can last as long as people want. It's an open discussion. Again, the rules of this are this is not just Q&A. The people here are uh, as knowledgeable as the people on the panel and so we urge you to feel perfectly free to make comments uh, or uh, engage in this conversation any way you want to, and not simply to, uh, to, to complete every, question, every, uh, uh, every interjection with a question mark. We also are playing by the Aspen rules, as we call them, which is that you take your tent card, if you have a question, Dick, can I have that, your, your tent card, uh, so that you put it up, as, as Dick is doing here, if you have something to say, and Derek or I will call on you. Um, if you have something that's urgent, where you just have a very brief comment that has to be made at that point in the conversation, we call that a two-finger interjection. Put your hand up that way for that interjection. That's the one finger popping <laughs> <laughs> Remember, it's all being taped. So choose your finger wisely. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's, there's nobody better, I think, to start us off thinking about the, the deci presidential decision-making than Richard Reeves, who not only was the top political reporter for the New York Times for years, uh, writes a column today, teaches at the Annenberg School, but has written several major presidential biographies, all of them superb, uh, uh, of Presidents Ford, uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, Reagan, and Nixon, and who has lived through all of those time periods, uh, as you do as a historian and a, com and a, uh, a reporter for time travel. So please join me in uh, welcoming Dick Reeves. Thank you. Uh, it is terrific to be here. Yesterday was terrific. It also reaffirmed my political decisions about Wesley Clark. Uh, <laughs> the, I actually was going to... Uh, uh, begin with my war stories, but Nasheen talked me out of it yesterday. I lived, my family lived uh, in Pakistan uh, during what they call Zia time in the early 1980s. And uh, when AQ, we were living in East 7 in Islamabad for a time near the Saudi mosque, and every morning armored cars would pull up uh, and take one of our neighbors, AQ Han, out to uh, Kahuta uh, so that there, there was never any doubt in Pakistan what was going on uh, about the bomb. And of course, he was then and later uh, a national hero. Uh, I had a good friend, a very good friend, uh, uh, went to Columbia with my wife and got a doctor with my wife there. Uh, named Shireen Mazari, who has just become the new editor of The Nation uh, in Pakistan. And the view from there, from Shireen, uh, was she took our kids around on a tour 
uh, of Islamabad, and there was a new stadium, there was a new mosque, there was a new library, and, and the kids were going ooh and on. She was saying, but we don't need a library. We don't need a stadium. We don't need another mosque. We need the bomb. We need the bomb. And it was, at least among elites in Pakistan, uh, a total consensus that you're only a grown-up country if you have the bomb. I was going to tell my war stories about that day, but Nasheen reminded me that that was all 30 years ago, almost 30 years uh, ago, and every place uh, has, has changed. We were there, by the way, because uh, my wife was setting up medical uh, stations uh, in the Afghan refugee camps in the northwest frontier province. Uh, and I was, because I was dragged there, I wrote a book called Passage to Peshawar and also did a front line called Red Star over Khyber. So it was, uh, was in those places in those days, but I, except for short visits, uh, have, uh, haven't been back and really don't know, realize a whole new generation has grown up. I don't know how they think. Uh, I will say this, though, in defense of my alma mater, and of the press. There was a marvelous story on the front page of today's New York Times uh, with Times reporters interviewing Afghans uh, across the country about what they thought uh, of the American uh, presence. Uh, so I will, uh, I don't know if I'm going to add much to, uh, to this because my topic uh, is, is a little more general in presidents uh, and the press. But I, to try to give you an idea of what I think about that uh, subject, I'm going to tell three uh, very short stories. One is after the 1986, uh, 76 uh, election on the eve of the uh, 1976 election between Carter and Ford, uh, Jim Wooten and I, uh, I had left the New York Times by then, but Jim was still there, and uh, we were sitting on the bus or doing whatever, probably drinking, and I said, so, you know, how, how strongly do you feel about this, and who are you for? He said, I feel very strongly about it. He said, I, uh, he had just finished, he was finishing the manuscript of a, a book he wrote called Dasher, which was the Secret Service's name for, for Carter. He says, by tomorrow morning, I'm either going to be the White House correspondent of the New York Times with a bestseller, uh, or I'm going to be the world's ranking expert on an unemployed peanut farmer from Georgia. <laughs> so that I, I want to make the point that particularly when you're talking about presidents and Washington, uh, the reporters have a stake in who they cover. Their careers uh, are made or broken uh, by, the, by one thing they don't control. That is, whether they're assigned to cover George McGovern uh, or, or Richard Nixon. Uh, uh, and you should always uh, keep that in mind. In a way, they are part of, uh, of a team. Uh, second, I, I once asked Bill Clinton when he was still in office, and I had asked Carter the same thing and got uh, the same answer. Uh, that was, do you get more information from the New York Times or from the CIA? And he said, the, there's no comparison, he said, the Times. Uh, he said, the, uh, the CIA said sometimes is a day or two uh, ahead of the news, but our real information bank is the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Uh, finally, in terms of, which is the most important thing I'll say, I think, uh, how do presidents get their information? I mean, that is the role uh, of the press uh, in this, that uh, presidents are by the very nature of the job isolated, no matter how smart they are. IQ doesn't have much to do with being president. If, if it did, there'd be statues of Herbert Hoover and Bill Clinton and Richard Nixon out there, uh, and, or Wesley Clark, who uh, he has always said he has an IQ about 210. Uh, <laughs> and he brought up IQ in the speech, which was very interesting. Uh, to me at least. Uh, John Kennedy uh, would work in bed the first couple of hours of each day. And uh, he'd read the papers, people would come in and kowtow and do 
uh, things and whatnot. And generally, the first thing he would do would be to look at the papers and call his brother, uh, or perhaps call someone else, depending on the subject. And uh, John Kennedy learned about the Freedom Riders when he saw the picture of that first bus burning in Anniston, Alabama. He had no, he called up, uh, first called up uh, Bob Kennedy, and then called up his civil rights advisor, Harris Wofford, uh, Wofford who got appointed the first time someone asked Kennedy a civil rights question. You have to remember that Kennedy in his inaugural address had only two words on domestic affairs. His entire inauguration speech was on, on the Cold War and uh, Harris had gotten him to insert the phrase and talking about uh, civil liberties, uh, the phrase and that home, uh, three words. Uh, in the speech. Those were the only words that touched on, uh, on domestic policy at all. Uh, so, but that's how he learned. Then he called uh, Wofford and said, uh, what the hell is this? Get your goddamn friends off those buses. This is the same president who, when African diplomats uh, complained about not being able to stop when they drove from New York, where many of them were stationed, uh, they, uh, to Washington. And they could not stop at the rest stops. They couldn't do anything like that. And, uh, and, and Wofford asked him, what should we do about this, Mr. President? And Kennedy said, tell them to fly. Uh, so that uh, that will lead into something I'm going to talk about. The, uh, uh, much of Washington uh, operates, and I don't mean only the press. Uh, you're, you know, your phone never stops if you're a New York Times reporter. Your, your phone never stops ringing. You never pay for lunch. Uh, now they have new rules, but when I did it, you didn't pay for lunch. Uh, and, the, uh, and much of that was essentially a feeder operation to the Times, to the Washington Post, and to the Wall Street Journal, the three papers that uh, any president looks at. And, and the news that was being generated out of that, people talked about sources, was for an audience of one the President of the United States. It is not easy to get to talk to the President of the United States or to, uh, or to talk to him. I was at uh, a friend's wedding, many people in the room know him, Canaletta, uh, with, uh, with my daughter. Uh, my daughter is a writer in the Obama White House. And we were standing there and a, a man named John Eastman, who was Paul McCartney's uh, brother-in-law uh, and handles uh, many of his affairs came up to my 25 year old daughter and said could she get a message to the president she said Paul McCartney has written three letters to him and uh, hasn't gotten an answer uh, so that my daughter well, she didn't but uh, and eventually the letters did get through but it is that audience of one that uh, determines much of what happens in Washington and much of what happens uh, to the press. Uh, and a lot of it is anonymous, that is leaks. Uh, the McChrystal uh, leak to, uh, uh, to Bob Woodward, I mean, these things don't happen by accident. They, in this case, they were trying to push uh, the president into a corner. Uh, Going back to uh, 1985 and Mort Abramowitz's, I don't know what happened. I was far out of the country uh, in those days, but uh, Mort's role in the Soviet war, as, as I call it, uh, had to do with getting Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen, which turned that war around in the same way it would turn around a war uh, for us. That is that once they had Stinger missiles, <coughs> Soviet helicopters and planes could not fly close to the ground. Pilots are not fools. They try to get above the range of what can be fired at them. I don't know how that, it would be interesting if Mort will comment how that decision came about, but I would not uh, be surprised if people both for and against that option uh, were busily leaking stories, anonymous stories, 
uh, in the press to try to, again, as McChrystal did, uh, set a framework uh, to push the president, the audience of one, into making the decision uh, they favored. Uh, that is all still true today. I mean, the speed of information has obviously changed, not as much as it did when the telegraph was, was invented, and we managed to survive that. Uh, but even when uh, information comes up, or news comes up instantaneously uh, on, a, uh, on a website or on a, a radio program or whatnot, it still generally, certainly from a president's perspective, uh, has to be confirmed uh, by appearing in the Times, the Post, the Wall Street Journal, the AP, uh, because uh, a president has to make his decision in the context of what does the public know. Uh, and so that it, and the public doesn't know what's on every w website, but if it is validated by the, main, the fading mainstream media, it has to be dealt with as a uh, political issue. And all of this goes both ways because the president is trying to reach an audience of 250 million people. And he needs the press, both mainstream and other now, uh, to do that. Uh, so that is, uh, and, and it's not only 250 million people here, it's billions of people in the world who are his audience. And so that the press remains critical in transmitting uh, in what it chooses uh, to transmit, although uh, uh, Mike Schuster's point about the press being intimidated, uh, Nusheen's uh, insight into the fact that uh, the government sets the agenda in the American press, whether we like it or not, and some of us uh, don't like it. Uh, Dick Wald, who was the managing editor of the Herald Tribune and then uh, president of NBC News, uh, used to say, our business is to be used and used. They want to use us, we want to use them, and it can be a very cozy uh, relationship. I mean, that's what trial, the press is there to float the trial balloons of the people uh, in power and see what, excuse me, uh, what happens. Going back to Kennedy uh, for a moment, he probably was the key figure, I think, in how uh, Washington and the presidency is covered. Because when Kennedy became president in 1961, uh, it quickly became apparent that the all news, was all, at least all good news, was going to come out of the White House. Uh, so that suddenly the press corps in Washington, which had been distributed over agencies, agriculture, labor, whatever, began, there were only, uh, there, the, the press corps uh, had shrunk at the White House, had shrunk to the dozens, uh, and it quickly went to the hundreds and then the thousands after Kennedy effectively centralized uh, information uh, at, the, uh, at the White House, and that continues uh, to this day. Uh, news management, which they accused Kennedy of, we accused, well, I was in school, they accused uh, Kennedy of news management. Well, news management is a very, very big and important uh, aspect of the presidency. Uh, I, I give a small example of that, uh, the great cut and run president, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, when after our barracks and the French barracks uh, were bombed in Beirut, uh, the uh, uh, Reagan immediately appeared to express his sympathy, outrage, uh, and the fact that this would not influence our policy or the presence of American troops uh, in Lebanon. They were stationed in the middle of Shiite slums, and it was an event waiting to, to happen. Uh, and Reagan then announced because of these, uh, because of changes in policy, uh, he was going to redeploy uh, the Marines in Lebanon. Uh, he did redeploy them uh, to ships. Uh, he got them out of there. And the, but the interesting thing about the news management of that is 
that Reagan, who in some ways lived on television, that decision was announced, he was in California at the ranch when that decision was announced, and it was announced in a statement handed out by the press secretary, because Reagan did not want film or audio uh, of him withdrawing troops uh, under fire. That's part of his job, and in his case, it worked. Uh, so I would argue that one of the engines of democracy, one of the most important is, uh, of our democracy, of American democracy, uh, is what the president knows and when he knows it. Uh, and that in the books that I did, uh, I, what I tried to create, recreate, as Mort made the point, you can't, uh, there is an essential distortion in 2009 uh, reconstructing the events of 1985. What did they know in 1985 when they made uh, these decisions? And an awful lot of commentary and bad history, too, looks at events of the past within the context, within the frame uh, of the present. Uh, so that what has happened in large measure in the American democracy is that the president, what he knows, and when he knows it, much information is much more democratized, and often the public knows the information at the same time, which complicates uh, getting out in front of the parade, if that's your definition uh, of leadership, because often the public has already made up their mind before the president gets a chance to uh, speak and act. Another point I'd like to make, and this is uh, if my daughter would talk to Obama on my behalf, and she won't, uh, Presidencies are defined by two or three or four uh, big events. Uh, that's how we remember presidents, and in fact, that's what they're there to do. The job is reactive. The campaigns do not reflect the events of the next four or eight years. No one remembers whether Lincoln balanced the budget, and it doesn't matter uh, whether, whether he did. I, I'm told that Bill Clinton, one of the... Uh, jolts for him on September 11th uh, was that relatively few things happened as they were talking uh, about yesterday, the dead decade of, of the 90s. Uh, not a lot happened, actually, uh, that history will remember during the Clinton presidency. On 9-11, one of the things he immediately realized uh, was that George Bush was going to be part of history, and he might not, the bitch goddess history, which is the real uh, mistress of any, any president. Uh, and, but again, I, I am saying it's a reactive job. Uh, he doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know what's going to happen. And their judgment in the end, as whatever judgment Obama eventually makes uh, on Afghanistan, will determine both his presidency and his uh, historical uh, legacy. Uh, reporters are living in a much smaller scale. Uh, they're defined, as I mentioned, by what they cover, who got the story first. Uh, the story often is a gift for services uh, rendered uh, by the press. It is the dominance of uh, the president. I told the Jim Wooten story. I might as well say that my, I don't know that my life was changed, but it was certainly enhanced uh, when what happened to me uh, was the best thing that can happen to uh, a book writer. That is, the president said uh, he was reading my book on Kennedy. Uh, and, uh, and we met a couple of times to talk about, uh, about the book, about Kennedy. And it was Bill Clinton, not Simon and Schuster, that uh, made the book a bestseller. When we sat and talked about the book the first time, he asked me, the first question he asked me uh, was, how did Kennedy get away with all that stuff and the press didn't uh, report it? Uh, I actually gave him some good advice about that, but he didn't take it. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I missed it. Uh, the end, uh, the point made by uh, Admiral Fallon about perceptions is 
uh, I thought was brilliantly done. That, that is uh, how, uh, what politics is. I don't know who the congressman who said that to him, but he was a pretty smart and direct uh, congressman. And one of the perceptions is that you are close to the president. Uh, which it helps if he carries your book. Uh, and the, uh, but the, the most interesting thing about the, I covered uh, the Carter campaign uh, and, excuse me, was, uh, and wrote one of the first favorable stories about the man who was, I was then working on a book called Convention which was a kind of tick-tock on the, uh, I, I was trying to do uh, Ship of Fools in real time. <laughs> and uh, so that, and Bob Strauss then was the chairman of the convention and the uh, uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee. And he, uh, so that he and I flew back here. He has a place in uh, Del Mar, flew back here after the, uh, convention, and while we were talking on the plane, he said, you know Carter pretty well, right? He and Carter did not get along at that time. I said, no, you know, I cover him, I talk to him. He, he says, w would you consider doing a favor for me? Uh, I said, well, I'd consider. And he said, uh, I'd like to be trade representative. Uh, I said, why do you want to be trade representative? He said, because if you get to be trade representative, when you leave, you are going to get really rich. Okay. Finish that story, and then there's a chance to ask for questions, including they can ask Mickey Cantor questions about getting rich, and they can ask, <laughs> and people can ask ask you questions about what it was that you said to uh, to Clinton. But finish up your point. Uh, finish up. Finish, finish up, because everyone has to hear. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, at any rate. Yeah, the presidents that I've known all see the, uh, the press in their own way. Uh, Bill Clinton, who believed that one-to-one -one he could persuade any human being of anything he wanted to <laughs> persuade them of, loved being with reporters. And I'm sure when they straightened out that White House, really when Leon Panetta came in uh, and began to keep the press away, uh, but up to then it was a movable feast. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the, but the most important thing that's happened, I think, uh, despite including ours, is was the attitude of uh, George W. Bush, Bush II, uh, about the press. And Andrew Carr defined that quite candidly. They considered the press just another business that wanted to get stuff from the government to make money. That there was no difference between an oil company wanting drilling rights and a news, a news operation trying to get information. So he didn't say this at the end of the sentence, but he might have, screw you. Uh, the, uh, and maybe that's a uh, thing. In the end, uh, now there are more players. Uh, the, the press has been greatly democratized, uh, all I'm sure uh, to the better, uh, and it, but it still is used to be used. And I'll end when uh, John Kennedy called his staff together uh, in the first week of his presidency, uh, a, a, a group, the uh, campaign group, which had been very close to the press. After all, the only non-government job John F. Kennedy ever had was as a reporter for Hearst. Uh, and at the end of that little talk, uh, Kennedy said, I want to say something about the press. These are all nice guys. I love their company. He was close friends with Charlie Bartlett, with Ben Bradley. He said, but never forget, there comes a point when they're going to go their way and we're going to go ours. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Richard. I was reminding Richard today that when I was a senior at university, he tried to persuade me to come work for the New York Times, but I avoided going over the dark side, Richard. <laughs> also, I haven't told you this before, but uh, I was the one who gave uh, your book to Bill Clinton. So. <laughs> 
but I, I gave didn't it to, know I gave that's it to, what he was I gave it to Derek. <laughs> Well, it's only appropriate since uh, Ambassador Galbraith has been chafing over the fact that my name card says Ambassador and his has it to remind you that uh, this is Ambassador Peter Galbraith who's going to be speaking to us in a moment. Uh, Peter has had a very distinguished career, first as a leading staffer and investigator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and then is President Clinton's ambassador to Croatia. And he has something in common with Mort Abramowitz that is Mort ran weapons to the Mujahideen. Uh, Peter ran weapons uh, to different groups in uh, the Bosnian War uh, and paid some price for it. But what Peter's going to try and do today is talk a bit about what it feels like to represent the government or the West in the case of the UN in a place that's difficult. He's been in Bosnia and now in Afghanistan. And he's also someone who paid a price for taking a position and then becomes an object of great press interest. He becomes the story as much as Afghanistan. So all those wonderful elements come together in the person of Ambassador Peter Galbraith. So, Peter? Ambassador, <laughs> thank you for that very kind introduction. Yeah, the um, wonderful thing about the titles is that then you don't have to remember anybody's name. Um, it doesn't doesn't quite work. I tried to get my children to call me Excellency at home, but they shortened it to XX, XX. It's like, oh well. Uh, but I will have to correct one aspect of, the, um, of your introduction. It was only the LA Times quoting, uh, uh, which, which uh, said that I was uh, running guns to anybody, uh, something that uh, then got Henry Hyde to do a million dollar investigation, which incidentally included asking people in my office about my uh, personal romantic life. At that time, however, I was single. Uh, so you see where his mind was going a, a year before he went after Bill Clinton. Um, Roy actually asked him about that at the press conference, and he kind of hemmed and hawed about what happened. Um, but in any event, uh, all I ever did uh, on Bosnia was to answer a question uh, from the Croatian president uh, to say I had no instructions, and to say I had no instructions was the instruction I had from President Clinton. Uh, and I suppose that is a nice segue into, uh, uh, Derek asked me to say a few words about uh, my own experience of going from being a UN official to, to being a story. Uh, because, in fact, once again, there's been a very exaggerated account in the press of what my role was. Uh, in, the press loves a whistleblower, and they love somebody who speaks out. And they have credited me with both qualities. Um, but I can tell you that nobody likes a diplomat who is a whistleblower, and nobody ever hires, again, a diplomat who speaks out, and certainly not one who loses his job on principle. Uh, and I did not uh, blow any whistles, uh, and I didn't speak out publicly until after uh, I had been fired, at which point then, at my age and having a certain innate combative spirit, and also frankly feeling that something very wrong had happened in Afghanistan, uh, and that I had, and, and in truth, above all, even beyond that, that I had a real obligation to the hundreds of people and, uh, who worked at UNAMA and the, the 20, or 20 or so who worked very closely with me on the election-related issues and the political issues who risked their lives, literally risked their lives to collect the evidence on fraud. I felt that I had an obligation to them to speak out. Uh, and because for a variety of reasons, I had a platform that, uh, that 
none of them were going to have, incidentally seven of whom have uh, resigned as a result of the, of, of the events that uh, led to my uh, dismissal. Seven, seven, seven of the U UN staff. And, and uh, just another word on them, it, uh, I have to say these were the, the best people, the best staff that I've worked with in, in my life. Uh, these are people who, in, in most, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not a, I followed the region closely for 40 years, um, but I'm, I'm not a great expert on Afghanistan. Uh, and, but what, what the UN has in Afghanistan, or had, because it's really disappearing, uh, is a cadre of people who have followed the country for years. Some of the former Soviet types were there as young diplomats in the 80s during the Soviet occupation, um, but, but also Westerners who had followed it in the 90s uh, and people who were in the UN mission from 2002 on. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of expertise, and I did not go in there pretending that I had the answers. I simply listened to what my, uh, what my staff, what my colleagues were saying, and the views that I represented within the mission were a synthesis of what they said. But uh, in fact, there was almost total agreement. There was total agreement about, about what happened. But again, my basic reason in speaking out uh, uh, after, uh, I was, uh, after I knew I was going to be dismissed uh, was uh, for, uh, it was to, uh, was, was out of a sense of obligation to a principle that my colleagues had, had uh, risked their lives to uncover. Now, I, I want to also emphasize that within the mission, I wasn't doing anything very dramatic. Uh, I was simply doing my job. I was the person who was, um, res I was the, the number two, but I had particular responsibility for the elections. The Security Council mandate called on the United Nations to support the Afghan institutions, and in this case it meant the Independent Election Commission, Afghan body administering the elections, uh, in, quote, free, fair, inclusive, and transparent elections. Uh, but it was clear that the Independent Election Commission, the only thing independent about it was its name. <laughs> Karzai appointed all seven members, uh, and six of the seven basically took their, well, they, 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 they served the political interests of Karzai in a blatant way. Uh, I mean, the, 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 these were not close calls. Uh, and so, and, and I have to say the difference I had with Kai Eide, uh, who is the head of the mission uh, and a longtime friend uh, who actually uh, had introduced me to the Norwegian woman who is now my wife. We, at one point we even vacationed together in the Adriatic. Uh, we're not going to be doing that this summer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the disagreement I had with him had to do with interpretation of the mandate. His view was that the UN's role stopped with supporting the Independent Election Commission, and my view included the rest of that sentence in free, fair, inclusive, and transparent elections. Uh, and why, why was that my view? Because, first, the international community, and above all, American taxpayers, we're paying for the elections to the tune of $300 million. It's like $300 million representing about 70% of the revenue of the Afghan government. So the Afghan government could not have held the kind of election that was being held there uh, in, in terms of the logistics and the, and, the, and the costs. And the second reason is that the elections were so critical to the military mission. Uh, the idea behind the elections uh, was that they would be a, a step on Afghanistan's path to democracy and stability. Now, I think the Obama administration understood from the beginning that that wasn't going to be, they probably weren't going to enhance the case for stability and democracy, especially since it looked like Karzai would win. But they, what they did not want it to, to, to do is what happened, which is to make the country much less stable 
and to undermine international support for the, for the uh, military mission. And that, frankly, is what I tried to avoid. Uh, at, in in uh, June, the entire focus of the international community with regard to the elections was on security, and it dealt with two, two issues. First, what was called four tiers of security to protect the polling places. The first tier was the police, the Afghan police, the second, the Afghan army, the third tier were ISAF forces, the, the NATO forces, and the fourth tier were mobile NATO uh, um, sources, uh, resources. And the, and the second was a, a plan of the Afghan interior ministry to, uh, uh, that was called the 4610 plan. Four police, four polling stations in secure areas, six in moderate risk and 10 at high risk. Uh, and more or less by accident, I came to the realization uh, or came, that not, that wasn't really the issue. The issue was that, that they had located some 1,500 polling centers out of 7,000 in places that were actually controlled by the Taliban or so insecure that when I began to ask, it turned out that nobody from the Afghan army, nobody from NATO, nobody from um, the police, and nobody from the election commission had ever physically visited the place. Uh, and I went and saw the, the Minister of Defense, not the Minister of Defense, but the uh, head of the army, of the military, who is uh, a northerner. Uh, and he, he said, oh, yes, yeah, so well, we can defend the, these polling centers. And then I said, okay, well, here's where they are. And I began to show him where they were. He goes, you're crazy. We can't defend those places. We're not there. You know, basically, it would have required an army to, to open those polling centers where they weren't going to open. But they had enormous potential for fraud because uh, what, 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 what could happen and what in fact did happen is that the election staff, who were all appointed by who? By this independent election commission, which was in turn the tool of Karzai, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the staff could say that the polling center had opened. Of course, the, po the polling center was inaccessible to any candidate agent, any observer, and any voter, so nobody would know that it hadn't opened, and they could report results. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the fraud became very obvious because the, it was so crude. Uh, my favorite is a district uh, near Kandahar called um, Shurabash, um, where the results were, there, each polling center had a certain number of stations, and there were two in Shurabash, each of which had eight uh, stations within each center. And the results were station one, Karzai 500, station two, Karzai 500, <laughs> station three, Karzai 500, four 500, then I think it was 520, 520, 530, 530, for a total result, result of 4,048 votes for Karzai out of a total of 4,048 votes cast. <laughs> and the other polling center had 4,000 and 56 votes for Karzai, zero votes for anybody else. I asked the Afghan interior minister, Hanif Atmar, who's a darling of the West, um, to explain you know, about this. And he said, you have to understand, Peter, that Afghans, so you, we're not like you. It's not an individualistic society. There should be nothing surprising that everybody gets together and makes a collective decision, and then they carry it out. <laughs> And I said, well, Hanif, that's very interesting. And, and you're so orderly that you show up in, uh, in groups of exactly 500. <laughs> he changed the subject. Uh, but anyhow, that, it, what, what, so I was trying to get these, these, what I called ghost polling centers, taken off the rolls. And I was, of course, stopped by Kai Eide, ordered me not to do it. Uh, I want to say here, there was no insubordination. I disagreed with him, but I accepted his decision. Uh, we then collected, with his approval, massive evidence of massive fraud, 80 pages. We, we were particularly focused on turnout, uh, in which um, we could show that the range of turnout in places like Kandahar was under 10 percent, and the votes recorded was uh, probably on average about 60 percent, although in some districts well more than 100 percent, when in fact no, there were no polling centers at all. I, I mean, Kandahar was very interesting, and it was typical. Kandahar City had the lowest reported turnout. 
That was, of course, the most secure place, and it was the one place where observers could be. The surrounding district, which was totally insecure, where there were no voters, had very high turnout. Uh, and that was, that was the, the, the typical pattern. But the head of the mission, Kayati, said, oh, you can't use that data or even talk to the diplomatic corps about it because it's unreliable. Well, you, you can't prove. You didn't have people at those polling centers counting the number of people who turn up. Well, of course we didn't. Uh, <laughs> partly because many of these places were, as I pointed out, in, in, in Taliban-controlled areas. Nobody could safely go there. And, and I couldn't tell you whether the turnout was 5%, 10%, 15%. But we could know with absolute certainty that it wasn't 30%. Uh, we, we had order of magnitude. And that's just critical in understanding whether fraud took place. And, and I want to emphasize here that the kind of fraud that took place in this election was not what I call retail fraud, the kind of thing that you know, may have occurred place in Florida or Ohio and so on that is very contentious in a close election. That took place too, yeah, people could wash off the ink that was supposed to be indelible. But it was what I, wholesale fraud. Uh, there, of, of Karzai's votes, at, at least a million, one third, were fraudulent. But I think the number may have been significantly higher because there was a UN-backed electoral complaints commission that looked at the fraudulent ballots or looked at the ballots to remove the fraudulent ones, but they had to show by clear and convincing evidence that the ballots were fraudulent. That, that might be, not be, there might be ballots that were fraudulent, but that they didn't uncover. And they also didn't do a full recount. They did a, very, they did a statistical sample. If they'd done a full recount, it might have been in the neighborhood of... Um, of, of a car size vote total might not have been 49 percent. Uh, actually, my information is a bit about 41, Abdullah 34. It's not inconceivable that in a fair second round, Abdullah could have won. Um, but there was no chance of that because in the second round, what did the election commission decide to do? Instead of closing down the ghost polling centers, it decided to increase them. Uh, it also, in, uh, in every instance where there was fraud, and mind you, we're talking about well over a million fraudulent ballots. In every instance, the fraud was committed by the election staff. They collaborated with those who committed the fraud, or they knew about the fraud and failed to report it. So, of course, the logical thing in the second round would have been to replace them. The election commission rehired the staff. Well, uh, in any event, just to... Uh, I simply kept raising these issues. I kept being turned down. I carried out my orders. Uh, and, but eventually, uh, in mid-September, uh, Kai and I are, it came to, we're, we're continuing to disagree. And I said, frankly, you don't have a lot of confidence in me on this issue. Uh, I don't you know, have actually a lot of confidence in you. Why don't I just go away for a couple of weeks while, you, while you're the boss, you handle this issue. Uh, and, uh, and, and we agree on many other things. And when I come back, I'll work on many of the other issues that I've been working on, particularly relations with Pakistan, where I was able to do things that others weren't, uh, and local governance, which is, I think, the key to, to success in Afghanistan. He agreed. Uh, there was, he was deeply unpopular in the, um, in the mission. Uh, it's too bad these things weren't decided democratically because the vote would have been about 2,000 for me and maybe four for him. Uh, but I'm unsure even if his special assistants would actually have voted for him. Uh, but that's not, uh, diplomatic missions are not democracies, and they cannot be democracies. They, they have to, the, the man in charge has to, or woman in charge has to run the show. So I respected the chain of command. I agreed to leave. But one of the staff people who was intending to damage Kai leaked the story of my departure to the Times of London. Now, I wouldn't have thought that the departure of the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations would it be, a, be a newspaper story? I, I suppose I grew up uh, always remembering McGovern's law. Uh, this was the law that George McGovern devised, which said, uh, in, in Washington, the longer the title, the less important the job. And you just heard me give my title. But uh, it fit into the press's perception that fraud was an issue. And now there was a way to personalize it. So the Times of London ran the story. <coughs> And that then was picked up by the British press and eventually the American press in a way that portrayed me as being 
uh, you know, standing for virtue and Kai as uh, wishing to uh, uh, cover it up. Uh, and that was, uh, that was fatal to me. Uh, the conflict arose. It went to the Secretary General. Kai told him, it's either him or me. He handled it in a very East Asian manner. The fight between the number one and the number two, the number one wins. They never investigated, never talked to me, never asked me about any of the issues. Um, I wrote a letter subsequent to knowing that I'd be uh, fired, uh, but that, which led to a 24-hour reconsideration, but that was basically it. That's, that's my story. Uh, I didn't have meant to dwell on it, but I guess I did. What, what about uh, where this leaves us in Afghanistan, and how is this relevant to anything? Uh, well, the, the, the core problem, the core issue is that uh, Obama's strategy depends on having a reliable, uh, having a credible local partner. And a president who is in office in circumstances where a significant part of the country sees him in office by fraud is not a credible partner. And there's another element to this. I don't know if we have the maps. Can I see, uh, do we have the ethnic map? Uh, in any event, um, okay. uh, Afghanistan is, uh, we speak of the Afghan people, and there is a sense of an Afghan nation. In that sense, it's different from Iraq. Uh, but. The, um, but, but it is divided into very distinct ethnic communities, uh, the largest of which is of the Pashtuns, who are about 45%, and the second, the Tajiks, who are about 25%, 10% are um, uh, uh, Hazaras, who are Shiites. Uh, but the, this election, uh, in, in many ways, be, was, a, was divided between the uh, uh, Karzai, who had support from the Pashtun community, although many Pashtuns do not see him as an authentic representative of their community. And Abdullah Abdullah, the former foreign minister whose father is Pashtun and whose mother is Tajik, and therefore in some sense is the one, one of the, a genuine Afghan in this context, but who is seen as a Tajik. Uh, and the, 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 the additional issue is that Although Afghanistan has a highly centralized political system under its constitution, de facto, the Tajik areas run their own affairs. And so you now have a president who is clearly seen as illegitimate by a large part of the Tajiks, as well as many others, in circumstances where they run their own affairs. So the, the, uh, the, the, the if you will, the disintegration of the country, um, not in the sense of separatism, but in the sense of not supporting, of the central government not having authority, has been very much accelerated by the, this fraudulent election. And it runs the risk that what happened in the 90s, early 90s, could repeat itself, namely the civil war between, between the, the, the North and the Pashtuns. The, what the, it was the civil war, not the, the Soviet war, that destroyed Kabul and, and cost so many lives. Uh, and this is certainly one thing that many Afghans fear is fallout from the election. Uh, what, and that, that civil war that, or that conflict between the Pashtuns and the Tajiks would be on top of what is a, already a civil war in Afghanistan, but strictly one today uh, within the Pashtun community. The Taliban is entirely a Pashtun movement. There are virtually no Taliban from any other community. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so you have a, 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 a civil war between the Pashtun-led government in the form of Karzai and the Taliban, complicated by the fact that uh, there are, I think, more Pashtuns in, Af in Pakistan than there are in Afghanistan, and so you also have the Taliban movement in, among the Pashtuns in Afghanistan. Now, what is it uh, that, in the absence of a credible partner, I would argue first, it, it makes no sense uh, to send additional troops uh, th because the strategy depends on a credible partner and that credible partner isn't there. Uh, and there's no real prospect in the near future of having such a credible partner. I think, would, again, it would be a different matter if there was a credible partner, but it, it isn't there. 
uh, and therefore the mission that the troops would be sent to do cannot be accomplished. Uh, I'm against a purely a counterinsurgency focus also because I do think there are important things in Afghanistan, including Kabul, that are worth helping to protect. Um, but uh, we have to remember that troops are a valuable resource, both in human terms and in terms of a resource that could be used elsewhere. Uh, and if the resource cannot be effectively used, it shouldn't be used. Uh, secondly, I think in, in, that one needs to look in a Afghanistan to significant structural or constitutional change. Uh, it has a Napoleonic uh, uh, structure, uh, a very centralized, uh, 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 that is to say, a system in which all power is, is, uh, is focused in the, is concentrated in the central government, where the president, for example, appoints all the local officials, the governors, the district governors, the, the line ministries. There's no real elected local government. There are provincial councils, but they, aren't, they, they have very, almost no authority. Um, and, and a system in which power at the center rests with the president. Uh, what Afghanistan actually needs is an Iraqi-style constitution. Uh, that is to say, one where power at the center is divided among different positions uh, in a president in Iraq, there's a president, there's a prime minister, but the way in which the supermajorities are required, the prime minister in Iraq basically has to apportion positions in his cabinet and significant positions to the different communities, the Kurds, the, Shi uh, the Sunnis, the, the prime minister is always going to be a Shiite, uh, in, 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 in proportion to their share of the population. And he doesn't pick the Kurds or the Sunnis are in the cabinet. The, the Kurdish parties and the Sunni parties pick their own representatives. And basically, that's the, if, if you had a, 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 a system where you had a prime minister, which doesn't exist in Afghanistan, and if the parliament rather than the president chose the cabinet, you would have meaningful sh power sharing among these different communities. Uh, and this is a proposal that Abdullah Abdullah has made in the campaign. I think it makes sense. And the second thing would be to devolve some power, some power to local government. Elected governors, and I would give the elected provincial councils some budget and legislative authority. Now, the, key, the, the, the other key problem in Afghanistan, is, as I observe it, and again, I'm really relying on expertise other than my own. I'm not pretending that in the brief time I was there, I'm a great expert. But the way, the, the, the center of gravity in the conflict of Afghanistan, to use the military, Clausewitz's term, is not in Kabul. It is, uh, uh, and, and Admiral Fallon was saying this yesterday, it is outside of Kabul. It's in the provinces and the districts. Uh, and, but the way in which Afghans experience government in the provinces and the districts is largely, it is as ineffectiveness, corruption, but most importantly, as abuse of power. They see local officials, or more generally, uh, uh, local power brokers able to get away with whatever they want. So the, the local power broker seizes a village's orchards. The, the village might even go to court and get a court order to get the orchard back, but they don't, in fact, get the orchard back. And, and that sense of injustice, the sense of abuse of power is what, in my judgment, has alienated much of the Pashtun population against the government. It doesn't make them pro-Taliban, but it makes them unwilling to stand with the government. There's no loyalty to the government. The Taliban, unlike, there, there's always discussion uh, of, of um, you know, why, don't, why can't we do in Afghanistan what we did in Iraq with the creating the Sons of Iraq, this Sunni movement? Why don't, we, why don't we create something like that in Afghanistan? Well, it's always one of the great mistakes is to think you can take one exa example in one country and apply it to another. This is a huge mistake that the United States constantly makes. In what the reason the sons of Iraq worked in, in Iraq is that the, the Al Qaeda element, the fundamentalist element, came in. They, initially, they collaborated with the local Sunni establishment. They killed Americans. The Sunni leaders were very happy about that, the tribal leaders. They killed Shiites, including just thousands of innocent civilians. The Sunni leaders were perfectly happy about that. But then, 
they began to say, and we'd like your daughter's enforced marriage for our fighters, just a legalized form of rape. We want your, your money, shaking down the sheikhs, as it were. And they began to kill the sheikhs. And at that point, these guys got together and said, well, they're a threat to us. They went to the Americans and said, we'll form a militia and we'll fight against uh, the al-Qaeda element. And in a very short period of time, they defeated them. The Taliban don't, aren't doing that. They, they, they respect the, the local elders. Uh, some of them support the Taliban, but most of them are probably neutral. But they are not challenging in any way the local power structure, except in the case where some of the elders might side with the government. But there's a pretty strong incentive for them not to do that. But the real problem here, and this is what I think is why I feel the situation is, is, uh, is close to, you know, it's, it, it's very hard to see a, a way forward. Uh, the, the real problem is that the government has lost the trust of the population, particularly in the Pashtun, well, in the Pashtun areas and in the north, as I said, they're de facto autonomous. Even if you could get good governance in there, it's not clear that you can win back the loyalty of the population because they would have to risk their lives to sign up with the, with the government side. And I think that they're, they're probably at this stage not prepared to do that. We also incidentally go about this in the wrong way. We have very, we apply all our, our Anglo-Saxon ideas. We believe that if somebody is out of office, they're out of power. So if there's a corrupt or bad governor, we want to get rid of him. Of course, we get rid of him. Doesn't mean that, that he has lost influence. In, in Kandahar, there's a very nice Canadian agricultural economist who's the governor, Afghan Canadian. He has zero influence. The power is, of course, held by Karzai's half-brother who helped organize the fraud. Uh, well, you can see I'm not wildly optimistic. Uh, Roy asked me to say a word, and I'll just say a couple of words about Pakistan, uh, which I spent a lot of time, and I was just there. Uh, I'll, I'll make a couple of points. First, one of the problems in Pakistan, and I touched on this yesterday, is that the Pakistani narrative, that the Pakistanis have their narrative of their relationship with the United States and they remember all of their narrative. Doesn't mean it's right. Uh, and we come in, we don't, we don't have any continuity. Our people come in and, who don't know the history and they accept the Pakistani narrative. And the Pakistani narrative is this. We Pakistanis signed up with America to fight, to help you fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. You used us. Uh, all through the 1980s and then once you'd kicked the Soviets out, you abandoned us. And you know, we're afraid you'll do the same thing again. Well, what was the reality of the, of the situation? When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan to the extent that they were a threat, and I think in retrospect it's clear they really weren't a threat, uh, that it wasn't part of an imperial plan for a warm water port, but that's how it was seen at the time. Uh, where, who did they threaten? Not the United States. We were far away. They threatened Pakistan. So the reality is that the United States came to the aid of Pakistan. Pakistan didn't come to the aid of the United States. But being Americans, we wanted to present it to the world, and we saw it that you know, these little people were coming to help us. So in some sense, we lost some of the leverage there. Secondly, on the nuclear issue, um, Pakistan made a public and private commitment to the United States, and I quote President Zia in December of 1982, quote, Pakistan has neither the means nor the intention of developing a nuclear explosive device. The guy was a liar, and he was lying. But that was a commitment he made to us, a superpower. And I have some, actually, the major role here. I simply put that commitment into law what became known as the Pressler Amendment, although it really was a Cranston-Glenn Amendment. Uh, and in 1990, Pakistan, it were, all, 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 the, all the amendment required was that the president uh, had to certify that Pakistan didn't have a nuclear explosive device, the very thing that Zia promised. 1990, they crossed the line, developed a device, and the aid was cut off, and the arms sales were cut off. Whose fault was that? They made the commitment? Nobody made them make the commitment? And they broke it. But the narrative is that we betrayed them, we cut off assistance, and, and we've been apologizing it for, for this for 20 years. 
well, my view is that we ought to be a little, little more, a little firmer in our, in our uh, defense of the, of the things we did, which were perfectly reasonable. The second part of, of Pakistan is basically uh, the, the, the country uh, is very divided. It's, they're, they're, it's divided ethnically. You have the Punjab, uh, the frontier, which is Pashtun, Baluchistan, which is also divided itself between the Baluch and Pashtun population there, the Sindh, which also has its internal ethnic divisions. Uh, it's a federal system uh, that you have the uh, potential for disintegration provincially on the pro pro provincial level. But you also have a, a, an Islamabad, uh, the civ elected civilian government. You have the army. You have the ISI. So you have uh, the army, which is a state within a state, the ISI, a state within a state within a state, and maybe rogue elements of the ISI, although I'm rather skeptical that these elements are actually rogue. Two of these, two of these elements of Pakistan, of the, of the uh, troika that really runs the country, live, in my view, in an alternate universe. And that alternate universe is to see India as an ongoing existential threat to Pakistan. It's not how the Indians see it. They, they, they don't focus that much on Pakistan. They're going their own way. Uh, and, and, and this leads them to pursue strategies. For example, support of anti-India, of terrorists operating in India, because the idea is that you will, uh, that, that the, these terrorist groups will tie down Indian divisions. Uh, and to see Afghanistan as, part, as, as a place to do battle with India. We'll support the Pashtuns, the Taliban, maybe a bit Karzai. The Indians are supporting the, the Tajiks and the Northerners. Uh, and so this, this is the mentality. It's, it, I think it's very destructive. It doesn't reflect the reality of, the, of, what's, of, what, of what the rest of South Asia is, going, is, is doing. But of course, it, it's, it serves the purposes of the Army and the ISI by helping them to justify their disproportionate claim on resources. Uh, and they're staying in power. The civilian government uh, and President Zadari have a different vision, uh, which is one, basically it's, it's, it's more or less, uh, it has similarities too, I won't say it's more or less the same, but it has similarities to what, what uh, the European leaders had in mind uh, in the late 40s, of the French and the Germans. That is a different kind of relationship. Uh, and President Zadari has ideas of joint infrastructure with India and a lot of other things that, which could change the dynamic of the region. And so that, in my view, um, support for uh, democracy in Pakistan is also support for a uh, hands-off, a, a Pakistani policy that's hands-off in Afghanistan and which has better relations with India. And conversely, support for peace with India is a way to strengthen democracy in Pakistan, and there are powerful elements uh, within the ISI and military that don't want to see either thing happen. Well, we've had two really excellent presentations, and because we also started a little bit late, we're going to adjust the schedule and run our discussion up until 11, and then we'll take a break at 11. So. Uh, Jonathan has a two-finger, not a one-finger comment to start us off. Um, just really quick to both of you. To both of you. Uh, Dick, you said that the president is an audience of one. And um, I think we have heard more wide-ranging briefing in the last 24 hours in this room than having read the McChrystal report than the president got, you know, three weeks ago. And that what scares me is at least people I know in the intelligence community said that there has been no NIE on Afghanistan. No one has asked the intelligence community to write a briefing that I would assume would include the kind of stuff that Ambassador Bramley would Ambassador Galbraith presented to us as well as what William Fallon did yesterday. And yet, 
it's as if the Defense Department has captured the intelligence function for this theater. And how did that happen? Either of you want to well, comment? Well, I, uh, I, I would look back at the uh, early Kennedy, or Kennedy's first year as president. I mean, uh, Obama, who obviously is a spectacular uh, candidate, uh, is learning on the job. I mean, if he, he, the Bay of Pigs was at least as bad uh, as this is. And, uh, but I find it hard, I do find it hard to believe that a guy that smart has not heard these things. I, I, I would switch it to Peter. You, do you think the president has heard what we've heard in this room? Uh, I, I, I hope he has. Uh, and I, I certainly see in his decision making shades of Kennedy on Vietnam in 1961, where there was this effort to stampede Kennedy into changing the military role in Vietnam and sending more uh, troops, which he resisted. Uh, and I hope Obama uh, comes out uh, uh, the same place. But I, I will say, from having been inside the policy process uh, in, well, in the, uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, having observed it from Capitol Hill and, and actually having seen how it worked in the Bush administration, writing a couple of books about it on Iraq. Um, there, there is, there is a, a huge tendency of, 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 of people in Washington to debate these issues without, with, without having, there, there's a, let me just say, there's a division between the people, uh, people who spend their lives and work in the field and people who spend their lives and work in Washington and who, play, and who work the policy process. And there isn't a lot of crossover. Frankly, there's not even a lot of crossover in the State Department where there should be. Um, and I, I feel that you cannot understand a country unless you've been there. I, I, had a, I, I had a very different view of Iraq from all the, you know, there were endless number of, in the advance of, of the Iraq war, endless number of, of think tanks, uh, people looking at what did we do in Germany and Japan, what did we do in Bosnia, how will this apply to the occupation of Iraq? But uh, there wasn't any real on the ground sense of Iraq. Uh, and, but I had spent a lot of time in Iraq, at least, and, and actually in all of it, but particularly in the Kurdish part. So I had, a, I had kind of different perspective. It came from talking to Iraqis. Uh, and I think, I think, I think this, is, 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 this may be, and I don't know, because I'm not in on the Washington process. Nobody from the, well, some people, I've talked to some people from the administration. But I think that the, um, that, 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 that perspective I hope it's there. I don't know that it's there. It, so often in, in other parts of the policy process, it's not there. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I think that's what's, what is required. But why is the intelligence community being kept out? Well, wait, let, let, me, let me say, I want to come fingers, back to that. I want to come back on the intelligence community. I, I, and I was talking to, uh, I, I don't think that what the, 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 what the intelligence community provides is necessarily the answer. I think what... Um, uh, it isn't just uh, what, uh, what Richard was saying, that the, the New York Times is, is the more important source of information. Uh, there are lots of sources of information. And, and, and it also involves talking to people and, 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 and conversations. Uh, but intelligence, intelligence adds pretty much at the margin. Some things it's very useful. I mean, if you want to know where the missiles are, uh, or if you're in a negotiation and you want to see what the other side's instructions are, or how they, how, or, or after you've talked to them, how did they report back to their capital? What the message you gave? Did they really get it? That's really useful stuff. But in terms of the intelligence committee pro, uh, community providing analysis of Iraq, of, of Afghanistan, I don't think it's going to add very much. I don't think an NIE of Afghanistan is going to add very much. It just becomes a useful tool in the congressional debate and all of that. I, can I add uh, a sentence or two to what I said, which has not been mentioned uh, in this room, uh, but I think is a major pop-up blocker, blocker uh, in, the, in the White House. To be elected president uh, after having opposed the Iraq war, uh, Obama had to say a number of things about Afghanistan, 
which he may or may not have believed, but is now bound by, or feels he's bound by. I think that if this same debate had gone on without him, be, he couldn't be called, all liberal Democrats are in a position of being called a wuss uh, and a coward and sometimes a traitor. Uh, and I think that, that, that Obama is thinking this through with one hand tied behind his back. And that hand is the promises he made and his rhetoric during the campaign. Well, and I think, I mean, as Dick knows, I mentioned this earlier, is what the Pentagon paper showed, is that decision making on Vietnam was always conditioned by the fear of the president being accused of losing a war, being weak, being soft. That's just part of the scene. Bob? Thank you. Uh, I mean, the, the, the press loves whistleblowers after the fact. Um, historians and, and wise sovereigns tend to love whistleblowers before the fact. Um, everything that you, uh, Ambassador Galbraith, described about this election um, seems entirely foreseeable, uh, not even requiring intelligence, not even requiring the New York Times, even a cursory reading of National Geographic, I think would have given you the su strong suggestion uh, that Afghanistan uh, was not a strong candidate uh, for running a legitimate presidential election um, in the middle of this war or at any other time. So my, I have two questions. One, um, the notion of basing a, a war strategy on a local partner who is legitimized through a Western-style election in Afghanistan seems a failure not just of intelligence, uh, but of strategy conception of the first order. Um, what do you know about the level of discussion about the, you know, what, what the, in Sicily would have been called un morte, una annunciata? I mean, this, this election was dead, you know, weeks before it happened. Um, and, um, my second question is, um, leaving aside the exposure of truth, which those of us who, with some history of the media, you know, honor and value in and of itself, what has been the practical effect of documenting the illegitimacy of this election? A few small questions, Ambassador. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Mort Abramowitz, uh, you, you, you preempted Mort's question. Or, or his point, or oh, maybe he'll come back and make it anyhow, uh, uh, that, that the elections shouldn't have been held. Uh, I, I, I guess I'll first back up and say the people who devised the Afghan constitution in 2002 are guilty of constitutional malpractice. Uh, beg your pardon? Brahimi. Uh, Brahimi, Khalilzad, and some of the others. First, for creating this ridiculous centralized system. Uh, and second, for setting up a schedule of elections so that over the next 20 years, uh, there'll be 15 elections, 15 years with elections. Uh, and furthermore, they set up a constitutional system that had elections at a time, scheduled elections at a time of the year when the weather made it impossible to hold them. And you wonder if those people in Bonn had consulted anybody about how much snow there was in Afghanistan. These elections were supposed to have been held in April of 2009 uh, by the Constitution. And there was a huge constitutional crisis when they were postponed because it was actually very difficult to hold elections in Afghanistan in April because a large part of the country is, under, is still snowbound. Um, but the, the second point uh, we come to, uh, Certainly for the Obama administration, I don't think anybody wanted to hold an election. I don't think anybody thought, well, this is going to be a great idea to legitimize our war strategy. The, ele the election was already scheduled. It was in the Afghan constitution. Uh, so who was going to go out and cancel it? And then who would be the president? Uh, I mean, these were some very practical problems. Uh, there might have been a solution, but it would have been a very radical step, and it would have been, if it had been pushed by the new president, it would have been resented by a huge number of Afghans, and it, it would have been uh, uh, 
uh, interference. But I also don't accept one of the premises of your, of your, your question, which was that that it was that it was impossible that it was impossible before the event to hold uh, honest elections. Uh, it's in, in fact, in many ways, the campaign that took place in Afghanistan was a pretty good one. Uh, the the candidates uh, had fairly detailed positions. They the, they explained them to the public. The, the media that we were hearing about yesterday provided a lot of good coverage. The state media was, was crap. It was all Karzai. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, but, but the private media provided good coverage. Uh, there was no, no violence between the supporters of the different candidates, uh, which if you compare any Indian election, there are several hundred people get killed. Nobody was killed in Afghanistan in a fight between the Karzai people and the Abdullah people or any of the other candidates. Uh, yeah, of course, it wasn't going to be like a Western-style election. I, I'm not sure so many of our elections are like that either. Uh, but uh, but um, it, was, uh, it, it wasn't bad. The issue was, could you have an, an honest count of the ballots that people actually cast? That was the question. And the answer to that question was, yes, it was possible. You didn't have to have an election commission that were a bunch of toadies of the president. With an election commission that was full of toadies of the president, the international community, the United Nations, which had responsibility for this, could have used its clout, which was significant because it was backed up by the US and, and the uh, other major countries, to have insisted on hiring honest staff and to have insisted on, an, on, re, on getting rid of the ghost polling stations and who have insisted on um, on, on uh, excluding fraudulent ballots. Uh, uh, one of the other things that I didn't touch on, but that happened on September 6th, the IEC had had procedures in place to automate, to exclude from the count fraudulent ballots. Uh, these were published. Uh, on September 6th, they came to the realization that if they followed their published procedures, that Karzai would end up with 47% of the vote and there'd be a runoff. So they met the next morning and had an epiphany. And the epiphany was that Afghanistan's electoral law, which these guys had been operating under for years, did not allow them to exclude obviously fraudulent votes from the tally. And therefore they had to include the fraudulent votes and it was those votes that brought Karzai to 54%, which were then to be examined by the, um, uh, by the Electoral Complaints Commission, you had this unnecessary eight-week crisis. If they had stuck with their own procedures at the end of September, at, uh, in, the, in the first week of September, there, there would have been an announcement, there would have been a runoff. I intervened with the Election Commission to tell them to stick with their procedures. And I said that we would speak out if they didn't. Karzai then got the foreign minister to summon me in to say I was engaging in unjustified foreign interference. And Kai Aidi, the head of the mission, sided with Karzai, said, well, we have to let the, the process work its course. But if we'd taken a tougher line, consistent with the mandate, we probably would have been in a runoff in September, and we wouldn't have had many of the problems that we're now talking about. So I don't accept the idea that uh, Afghanistan was, is such an unfortunate country, and its people so primitive, that you couldn't have an election, uh, a, a satisfactory election. And I certainly believe it was possible to have an honest count of the, of the vote. Okay. Roy? Uh, your, uh, I didn't uh, realize until uh, yesterday that you were the uh, actual author of the Pressler Amendment, although I should have remembered, um, going back some years. And I just wonder whether, in, upon reflection, you think that there were <coughs> consequences that at the time were unintended. Uh, for example, uh, that the Pakistani uh, military in many ways was cut off from the <clears throat> uh, kind of uh, educational opportunities and training and exchanges that they had had with the American military throughout the 90s, <clears throat> uh, not to mention all the weapons, of course, and that uh, uh, this uh, maybe ha helped lead to this alternative universe in which they now operate. Uh, I'm sure it's not the only cause, but uh, certainly it has been widely cited that sanctions of this kind uh, have proved hugely counterproductive in 
<clears throat> many other places, and I think Pakistan might be one of those cases. Um, and then secondly, on your basic conclusion that um, there is really a very difficult way forward, uh, that there is no credible partner in Afghanistan, um, and uh, I think your argument is pretty cogent. <clears throat> uh, the problem is I wonder what some of the, and, and therefore that Obama should not follow General McChrystal's uh, advice and send in additional forces. I wonder if uh, what you would say are the consequences uh, of, uh, of not doing that and whether you might want to even consider what <laughs> some of the unintended consequences might be. I just have the feeling that what you're suggesting is that Karzai has to be replaced. And I think that if there's ever a Vietnam kind of scenario, it is <clears throat> the United States uh, reaching that conclusion at the very top that that man has to go uh, and that somebody else should replace him. And then I think we're really on a downward spiral. I mean, I don't know if that's in intended, unintended, uh, but I think it would be a consequence. I think we're all aware of the GM <laughs> precedent. Um, let me, let me I'll, I'll take the, those questions in order. I, perhaps I'll give you a brief history of the Pressler Amendment. Uh, this, uh, Very it, brief, please. Uh, well, it, 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 it's, it's, it's actually quite, quite amusing. Uh, uh, this came up, because uh, uh, I, I wouldn't want you to think I'd worked closely with Senator Pressler on the matter, which is not the case. <laughs> um, I wrote an amendment uh, for Glenn and, uh, Senator Glenn and Senator Cranston, who are deeply concerned about nonproliferation, that basically would cut off arms sales and assistance to Pakistan unless the president certified three things. Pakistan does not possess a nuclear explosive device, is not acquiring material and technology for a nuclear explosive device, um, and uh, does not, and it doesn't have the intent to acquire a nuclear explosive device. In any event, that amendment passed the committee unanimously. Basically, the Reagan administration, the, the undersecretary who was there was pretty incompetent. He couldn't explain their, why they were against it. Everybody said, this is what Zia promised. Of course, I had Zia's words. Uh, and it was agreed. The administration then said, if that language remains, we're going to kill the foreign aid bill. And so the Republicans got together, and they came up with a substitute, which was uh, authored by, well, was authored by Hans Benedijk uh, and uh, uh, presented by Percy, who's the chairman, Pressler, and Matthias. Uh, and it was identical to what I had written, but it only had that first test, namely that Pakistan does not possess a nuclear explosive device. And so this <coughs> amendment, which passed by one vote over as a replacement for the tougher Cranston-Glenn amendment, was actually a pro-Pakistan amendment. The irony is that Pressler then began to see himself as having been a champion of India. And in the 1996 South Dakota Senate race, the Indian community poured in, I, I don't mean the uh, American Indian community, but the Indian American community <laughs> poured in millions of dollars to Larry Pressler's losing campaign, whereas the Pakistani American community put in millions of dollars to Tim Johnson's winning campaign for an amendment that was actually, again, it started out as a pro-Pakistan amendment. Now, to, to answer your, your question about it, the amendment, it, like any, any sanction that is meant to serve as a deterrent, it's terrific. And, and it did force, pa Pakistan had actually crossed the line in 88. And we, I was, we were able to use the amendment, and I was part of this because Benazir was the prime minister, and I was able to talk to her privately about it. We were able to push it back, back across the line. So in that sense, the amendment was useful. But once they then did cross the line, the amendment was counterproductive. For, exact, for, the reasons you, for two reasons. One is the reason you say. But actually, it also, there was another one, which is basically we were now in the position of telling India and the rest of the world that Pakistan had nuclear weapons. And that was going to affect Indian thinking. Uh, and so actually, when, when they came down to see Senator Moynihan and me to talk about it, um, Larry Eagleburger, we said, basically, lie. Make, you know, please continue to make the certification. But they, they followed the law. Um, on the... <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> what can I say? The consequences, um, yeah, I mean, I think everybody's aware of the GM precedent. Uh, in the end, though, you have in Karzai a leader who is ineffective, runs a corrupt administration, now hopelessly tainted both internationally and at home with fraud. 
uh, I think that that is a real problem. There are, I suppose, ways to get around this, which includes uh, having a lawyer jirga in Afghanistan for constitutional change. And, uh, but, but clearly, any, any, if, there is, if Karzai is to be replaced, it would have to be done in a constitutional way, not in the DiEM manner. And for my students, if you don't know the references, read up on the Vietnam War. <laughs> Mort? I want to deal with the intelligence issue. Uh, but before, well, that was raised previously, but before I, I do that, I'd like to say that Peter has made a very powerful presentation about why the election should not have been held. I think the Obama administration screwed up royally. They thought they were going to have a defining moment in Afghanistan. They, they sent an 80 or 60 man team out there, spent $300 million, and it was a profound mistake. Peter and I have a difference on it. But that is basically... It, it was a defining moment. <laughs> yes, that's right. It was a defining moment, absolutely. Now, on the intelligence business, uh, I, I think you have to recognize that the chairman or the fellow who was leading the, interna the initial assessment came from the intelligence community, had been there all the time. He knew the issue. The problem, however, is that the intelligence community is not very good. It has not been good when I was there, and it's gotten worse because uh, they have a group of largely young people who've never been to these countries and do not understand them. And so I am not, I personally am not very sympathetic to the present utility of the intelligence community on matters of government assessment and those soft issues. Uh, secondly, I think Mr. Obama has, suffers from a big failing. One big, he's an extraordinary man, but he sort of believes that if you get all the smart people around town, get them together in a room and ask the right questions, you're gonna get the right answer. That is not true. It simply doesn't happen that way. It's better than getting all the dumb people around the table, <laughs> but, 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 you, but you don't necessarily get an answer. And I think, they have made profound mistakes. And one demonstration, as I said yesterday, of that profound mistake is Obama recognized it and has had a reassessment of policy. And he's absolutely right to have done that. And uh, I think Peter raises very important issues as, and you get all sorts of views as to how we should proceed. Uh, and I, I'm glad Mr. Obama's reassessing the issue. I think it's very important that he do so. But he has to, uh, stop relying on, on the notion that you can easily define, define an answer here. Rob? Peter, I wanna uh, take a moment just regarding your comments about Pakistan and your analysis of it. I think you're completely right that there's a certain kind of a dysfunction in Pakistan which, it, which involves a sense of demonizing India by, by putting the blame on, on India and sometimes the West, outside forces. And that's not a very productive kind of approach for the country. At the same time, I think that some of the analysis misses the point of what creates that, that very problematic anti-American rage. I was there last fall, uh, last September, and was talking to, to a, my mother's friend who was a very pro-Western guy talking about how, you know, we're at that point where if America just exploded today, nobody would give a damn. Nobody would care. And if you go back to some issues, like your, your, your uh, case that, that the, the war against the Soviets was actually for the benefit of the Pakistanis, right, that's not the Pakistani narrative, but it sounds a bit disingenuous because if, if perhaps it was Zia's mission to keep the Soviets out, but again, in a country that has not had much luck with democracy, either dysfunctional democracy or military dictatorships, you have not really had, it, I never sensed it was the will of the people when I was there that we got to get those Soviets out of there. This was a sense of things happening over our head. And even today, there, there is that sense where you praise Zardari, who rightly has a wiser approach to India than some predecessors do. On the other hand, there's something very problematic about Zardari, which is he is one of the most horrible possible leaders for any nation in the world. And most Pakistanis believe America sprang him on us 
this guy could not have come to power if, Amer if, if America did not, if Washington did not decide, well, we've got the military dictator there, he's not quite having enough credibility, let's bring back Benazir, let's see what we can do with, with uh, Sharif and so forth. So th again, there's a, there's a larger sense of meddling. And though even though some of the kinds of things you're getting at sound right, I feel like to sort of take that approach and try to win that, that argument would uh, make things, well, I don't, again, I don't think you can make things worse in terms of the sentiment on the street. Yeah, I think Rob makes an important point that there are different narratives. And uh, the narrative about the first Afghan war was the Cold War. And it was us versus the Soviets. And I don't think we cared one bit about the Pakistanis or the Afghans. This was a cosmic war between good and evil, and these were surrogate areas. And one of the problems with Afghanistan is that it's not about Afghanistan. It's still about the war on terror that George Bush proclaimed, and all of these pieces are still part of that narrative, even though Obama doesn't use the language. Uh, but, let me, Derek, if, if I could, I can say that what, what you say may be true. Uh, that may have been why we decided we wanted to support the covert war in Afghanistan, why we wanted to provide aid to Pakistan. But as a diplomatic tool, uh, we were also helping Pakistan in a situation where it, at least its dictator, felt mu was, was on the front line uh, in circumstances, therefore, w where we had leverage that we chose not to use. And the most important place where we chose not to use the leverage was in allowing the Pakistani ISI and Hamid Ghul to decide which Afghan groups would get our assistance. And they gave them to the biggest thugs uh, who are today the people that we are fighting. Uh, and so there is direct blowback from the weakness of the Reagan administration, frankly, the, fa the failure to exercise American power, uh, and, and what happened, what, and, and what happened, including, frankly, uh, what happened uh, on, on, on September 11th. Uh, the, the, other, the other point is that there's an element in Pakistan of, of great national insecurity, a huge inferiority complex, mm -hmm. uh, which is not the fault of, of the outside world. It, it has, I mean, there's a long history to it. Uh, so that anything that happens is seen as a conspiracy. Uh, and even the very mild forms of intervention or discussion that took place, which were entirely appropriate, on the return of Benazir and on restoration of democracy was somehow seen as an American hand to bring back Benazir, which certainly was, was not, uh, not the case. Joan, why don't we make Joan the last question, comment, and then we'll have the, oh, do you want to, okay. Oh, <laughs> oh, wait, two more, and that's it, Joan. Jonathan Taplin's remark about the why is the intelligence community voice heard more, I just want to say it's not like a unified intelligence voice anyway. I mean, it's not just the CIA saying what they think. It's the CIA, it's the DIA, it's the NSA. It's the, there are like 10 or more intelligence voices that, are, that come through the White House every day. And what has to happen is someone has to be trained to hear those voices and to see where the biases are and to see what the big picture is, and to see, to, to integrate all of that with what's going on in the region, with, with the, the priorities and the histories, and there is a big gap in, in that, I just wanna, wanna say. Yeah, yeah but, but an NIE is a very static kind of thing, and it is not always, it sometimes just comes across as another report by another biased point of view. So what, yeah, but it's supposed to be the collective. It's the supposed to be. Well, but I'm just saying, in my own experience back there working in intelligence, I mean, you know, you come in in the dark and you, at six in the morning and you read the, the papers first, and then you read all of these intelligence voices, and then you try to see where the discrepancies are, and you try to see what, there's a whole science to it. And I'm just saying, the, I, the best thing I think that's going on right now is that there's a pause, that there's some deliberation, and that, that perhaps there'll be some independent thinking. Okay. Mickey has a two second and then Ina, and then we're gonna break. Everybody listen to what Peter Galvin said. The more specific the information from the intelligence, here, I'm sorry. 
Hear what Peter Galbraith said. The more specific information you get from the intelligence community, i.e., what does somebody say in a room about a negotiation, what happened after that in the room, and so on, is very good. The further away you get from that to analysis, the, more, the worse it gets. Hear what he said. That's really important. Don't put too much reliance on the intelligence community to tell you where policy ought to go. And as I used to say when people asked me what it was like to have CIA gays, you know, working for you and with you, I'd say, they're just people we went to high school with. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Nina? Hi. Good morning. Nina Coleman, Feminist Majority Foundation. This might be a controversial question, but here it goes. Um, yesterday we heard about some of the comments about the press and the media that they're intimidated by government, so sometimes they don't report on some of the issues and the details that they should. And looking back over the years, looking at the Clinton administration, Bush administration, now Obama administration, it seems to me that the press is more intimidated during a Republican administration than a Democratic administration. Um, I don't, I don't see to, to the press having a lot of problems vilifying Clinton and some of the things that happened during the administration. Um, and so if you agree with my theory, which you may not, this is for Richard, um, why do you think it is that the press um, stays intimidated, does, has trouble having a, have, having a spine when their duty is to tell it like it is? Well, I agree. Uh, I agree with what you said and what Mike said yesterday about the intimidation. And the truth is that the reason we are intimidated in general is that we are a bunch of uh, liberals uh, who come from, we're a self-selected group of people. Uh, the wonderful thing about being a reporter is you become one by saying you're one. Uh, so that we know what the Republicans are saying about our biases are true. Therefore, we overreact, we have a certain sense of guilt uh, because we're gonna deny it generally in public. You know, we're objective. And, uh, fair and balanced, too. Uh, the, uh, but the reason the Republicans can whip us that way exactly is exactly the same reason that we are just as intimidated as Obama was intimidated uh, about, would be intimidated about attacks on his patriotism uh, over uh, Iraq and therefore chose to choose Afghanistan. To make it short, yes, we are. Uh, liberally biased and two, and the Republicans are smart enough to know that we will either compensate or often overcompensate in their favor. All right, on that uh, joyous, joyous Joy note, <laughs> uh, we're gonna take a 15 minute break and uh, there's coffee and snacks and then uh, come back for the next panel. Thank you, you guys were great.